This is chapter eight and lesson one, bonding in molecular structure. We're looking at the DNA molecule right here. DNA stands for deoxyribose nucleic acid. And you can see different colors of spheres in, the, in one kind of model. And you can see another kind of model over here using um, symbols of the atoms and lines for the bonds. And the one type of model merges into the other model, which shows a better sense of three-dimensional space. Now, DNA, you'll, no you'll notice because of the different colors, is obviously made up of different kinds of atoms. And you have carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms and nitrogen atoms. And there's also some phosphate ions. You might remember that phosphate is PO4 with a minus 3. And then uh, in order to connect, um, it's going to look a little bit different than that in three-dimensional shape. Now, as we look at the uh, structure of the DNA molecule, you might remember that the DNA molecule is sort of like a spiral, a ladder that's twisted around some central axis, a spiral stair staircase. It was first elucidated in terms of its structure back in about 1952-53 by Watson and Crick. Um, and based upon x-ray uh, and other types of uh, structural determinations, Rosalind Franklin was the one that did all the heavy lifting and often gets very little of the credit. Watson and credit, uh, Crick both got Nobel Prizes. Now, as we look at this particular structure, you'll notice that uh, the carbons are pictured in gray, and I'm sorry, the hydrogens are picted, depicted in, uh, let's back up. The carbons are depicted in gray, but the hydrogens aren't shown at all, as far as I can see. Um, the oxygens are in this pinkish orange color. The nitrogen is in blue. And you can see the phosphoruses right down here. There's a phosphorus, and there's a phosphorus. And um, you can't see all of the phosphoruses, but the phosphoruses and the, are, go up around the side like this, and they come around like this as it twists and turns. And the sequence is along the sides of the double helix, is you have a sugar and then a phosphate and then a sugar and then a phosphate where the sugar is called deoxyribose. The name of the sugar is deoxyribose. Now you may have heard of RNA and the name of the sugar in RNA is called the ribose sugar. Now you recognize the O-S-E ending which is a common suffix in biology for the different kinds of sugars, like glucose and fructose and galactose and maltose. Obviously, ribose and deoxyribose means that uh, an oxygen has been knocked off. There's a missing oxygen in deoxyribose compared to ribose. Another thing that you should notice is that the base pairs, switching to a different color, are right here. These are the rungs of the ladder. These are the spiral staircases, wherever you see these dotted lines. Um, you can see the rungs of the ladder, the um, stairs of the spiral staircase. And they always go like this. Thiamine always attaches to adenine, and cytosine always attaches to thiam um, guanine. And so you can have these possible base pairs. A base pair is going to be a pair of bases, logically. And there are four bases. Thiamine is pictured here. Cytosine is pictured here. And the possible combinations are going to be thiamine 
will connect to an adenine or adenine connect to a thiamine in that order. Or you might have cytosine connected to a guanine or guanine connected to a cytosine. It turns out that um, adenine and cytosine are similarly shaped and thiamine and guanine are similarly shaped. So instead of having a base 2, and here I'm using the word base as in base 10 in the decimal system, in computers we, ha we use a base 2, which is zeros and ones in different sequences represent um, the code. Well, DNA represents a code in base 4, and the base 4 are made up of thiamine, adenine, cytosine, guanine in different combinations. That's where the information lies. We should also point out that the bond between sugar and phosphate up and down the sides of the DNA molecule is prescribed. Uh, in other words, there's a very, very definite bond that dictates that um, after, a, after a sugar, you need the phosphate, and after the phosphate, you need the sugar. There are also bonds that connect the sugar to your base pairs. Each sugar is connected to a base pair. That bond is also prescribed, meaning um, it, it has to be there. However, the what connects the two bases together within the pair, we know that that connection is a hydrogen bond, but the most essential part of this molecule is the sequence of the base pairs. The sequence of the base pairs has no rule that predicts what the next base pair is going to be. For example, if you have the base pair of a thiamine adenine, um, uh, there is no um, uh, rule that says that the next base pair has to be such and such. And that's what re is required for a true code. A true code is not one where um, if you have one symbol, you know what the next symbol has to be. A true code, meaning a code that represents information and therefore requires a mind to construct it and a mind to decipher it, means that there is no physical law that requires that if you have one coded element, that the next coded element has to be such and such. Because if that were true, it wouldn't be much of a code. It wouldn't contain much information. For example, in a crystalline structure, you often have sequences of or arrangements of positive and negative ions. And you can predict what that next ion has to be. So it doesn't carry much information. DNA compares, com contains more information in the 23 pairs of human chromosomes than does the entire computer software of Microsoft Works, consisting of Word and PowerPoint and uh, database management and so forth. And this is according to Bill Gates himself has remarked on this. So a real problem for evolutionists and materialists is how do you explain the origin of this DNA? Where does the original information, which is the sequence of these base pairs, that dictates, among other things, um, what the proteins are going to be and what their structure is going to be. Where did that original information come from? And that has been an increasingly bigger and bigger challenge to any materialistic, non-theistic um, explanation for the information stored in a DNA molecule. And that's just one place of information storage. All right, so having said a little bit about DNA and reminded you of your biology, we're going to go to the next uh, page, the chapter goals. So we're going to be reviewing what from freshman, from, uh, excuse me, your honors chemistry class or regular chemistry, the difference between ionic and covalent bonds, and realizing that they're really more on a spectrum from pure covalent to pure ionic. And very few bonds are purely covalent or sharing or purely ionic, which is an exchange of electrons. We'll get to that more later. We're going to learn to draw Lewis dot structures. 
We're also going to learn about the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory and how to use that theory as a way of drawing um, molecules and uh, polyatomic ions. We're going to learn about one of the periodic trends called electronegativity uh, later in the chapter and formal charges. This will not be in this particular screencast. And um, that's some of the information that we hope to gain by studying this chapter. So, uh, we have known for a long time that the key to interpreting the properties of a chemical substance is to learn its structure. Structure determines function. This is especially true when we talk about proteins, for example, in biology. You look at the structure of something, you can begin to determine um, what its purpose is, what its properties are going to be. And this is true, of course, if you were to look at um, a car, if you were to look at um, various organs in the human body, if you were to look at a house, um, just about any time you figure out the structure of something, it gives you clues as to what its purpose is, what its properties are going to be. So structure is going to determine the ways in which the atoms are arranged in three-dimensional space. And bonding is going to describe these forces that hold the adjacent atoms together, um, as well as forces that hold individual molecules together. Now, key to all of this is the fact that this is very predictable. If something is predictable, that means it's following a, a um, rule or a law. And that rule or law, in order for the, something to be predictable, has got to be true from day to day and place to place. If you have a different rule of bonding every single day or a different rule of bonding in every single different country or every single different temperature or every single different situation, that's not going to be very predictable, not going to be very, very helpful. But God has designed a universe um, where you have these patterns, these regularities, which means that they are predictable, which therefore means that they apply from time to time and place to place. And this gives us a little bit of uh, an idea of the character of God. If God is the one who has created a universe with patterns and regularities that are predictable from time to time and place to place, it's because it reflects him. It's because it, it reflects him, who God himself, who is eternal and doesn't change from time to time, as well as a God who um, is omnipresent. He is everywhere. He is not restricted by space any more than he is restricted by time. And because he is same, the same from place to place and from time to time, his creation reflects those attributes. All right, let's get from, go from the philosophy now into the practical application of that philosophy. Chemical bond formation. We're going to be focusing on valence electrons, the electrons in the outer shell not to be confused with the core electrons, the electrons in the inner shell. And those valence electrons, uh, depending upon the number of them and where they're positioned and so forth, can create a net attractive force. Obviously, it's not going to be a repulsive force, so you wouldn't have a bond. So this net attractive force is going to be a chemical bond. And when this bond forms, it's going to hold two atoms together within uh, either by themselves or within a larger group of atoms. So let's first of all talk about an ionic bond. An ionic bond basically involves the transfer of um, electrons from one atom to another. And when we say transfer, well, we should be careful to remind, and this is a preview again of what we'll be saying numerous times in the next few minutes, that it's not a complete outright transfer usually. Most of the time, it's, it's, it's a transfer that um, is uh, predominant. It's the most obvious, but it doesn't mean an outright transfer. 
Well, you, we can use percentages in a few minutes to describe this. Uh, in eighth grade, and even at the beginning of 10th grade uh, chemistry, you, you are taught that an ionic bond is the transfer of one or more electrons from one atom to another. And we're going to see that that does not mean there isn't a little bit of sharing left behind. So a good example would be if we do the electron dot structure, the Lewis structure for sodium, and we show it's one valence electron in its outer shell. Remember, sodium is going to have two electrons representing hydrogen and helium, and then it's going to have eight electrons in the next energy level, representing elements 2 through 10 being neon, and then in its last, outermost energy level, it's going to have one electron, its 11th electron. That electron is the one that we represent with a dot. Chlorine almost has an octet, almost has eight. And when we, it's the seventh element in that second row. And when we assign the electrons, we do the first electron in one orbital, and then the next orbital, then the next orbital, then the next orbital, then we pair them up, and then we run out of electrons. And you'll notice that there is one lone electron. Well, since sodium has one lone electron and chlorine has one lone or unpaired electron, if sodium gives its electron to chlorine, then sodium falls back to an octet. And so using a different color, if we get rid of this outer shell, you'll notice that chlor um, sodium now has this as its octet. Four pairs, very stable. And chlorine now has an octet. You can see them here. Um, there's one pair, two pair, three pair, four pairs for its octet. And so my positive sodium ion is attracted to my negative chloride ion, and I have sodium chloride as two atoms within the crystalline structure called um, table salt, sodium chloride. And you can see that sodium and chloride um, are much more stable when they are together than when they are apart. Now, covalent bonding is the sharing of electrons. And again, it's not perfect sharing. Um, it, oftentimes, it can be perfect sharing. For example, when you have two elements that are the same, then it's going to be perfect sharing because there's no reason to think um, or assume that one chlorine is going to have the electron just a little bit more than the other electron. So here's an illustration that might be helpful. Let's say that you and I decide to purchase a basketball together. And let's say that we're getting a good basketball, and I haven't priced a basketball in a long time. I still have my basketball from years and years ago that um, when I used to play basketball every single week, and then before that, I pray, played it almost every day, certainly during basketball season, um, for a lot of years. But let's say it's a $40 basketball. Well, it's possible that you and I could each chip in $20. That would mean that, by all rights, we should perfectly share this basketball. Um, you should have it 50% of the time, and I should have it 50% of the time. Or maybe we might go this way, an $18-$22 sharing. That would still be a covalent bond. Um, it's not a perfect, pure covalent bond. It's a little bit unbalanced, which we would call a polar covalent bond. And... You might have the basketball if you were the one that contributed the $22, maybe a little bit more in your possession than I would because I only contributed 18 And we could go to, let's say, $15 and $25. This is even more polar. This is even more unbalanced sharing. But at some time, we get to the point where maybe I contribute 10 and you contribute 30 and at the, and, it's, and our covalent bonding begins to become what we would call ionic bonding, where in a sense, since you p paid almost all the money for the basketball, that basketball, which is representing an electron, um, primarily belongs to you and not to me. And we can even go all the way down to $1 and $39. And this would be a very, very um, unbalanced sharing. We would call this 
in the words of chemistry, a, an ionic bond. Maybe that helps to understand that um, ionic and covalent bonding are really on a spectrum going from pure covalent to pure ionic. And somewhere here, there is a point where we, by definition, and it's based upon electronegativity differences, we stop calling it a covalent bond and start calling it an ionic bond. So you can have a bond that is weakly covalent or weakly ionic. And I drew this dotted line in the middle of the spectrum, but it's technically, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the middle as far as electronegativity is concerned. All right, covalent bonding in Lewis structures. And there are many examples of this. And since we're getting ready in chapter 10 to talk about organic chemistry, there's a lot of stuff I'm going to be saying that relates to organic chemistry, and you need to keep it in mind as background information when we get to chapter 10. So, for example, the gases in our atmosphere very much are covalent compounds where there's going to be a sharing of electrons going on. Um, fuels, again, covalent compounds, hydrocarbons like octane in our gasoline or propane or butane in a butane lighter. Most of the compounds in your body, your proteins and your carbohydrates and your fatty acids and oils and lipids um, and your nucleic acids like the aforementioned DNA and RNA, um, these are all covalent compounds. In fact, you don't really expect to see anything except covalent compounds um, whenever you're working with an element that's almost all non-metals. Now, there are some polyatomic ions that have a, um, might have a metal in the interior part of the structure, and we'll put that aside for the time being. Uh, it isn't until we get to metals that we begin to talk about ionic compounds. The presence of a metal in a formula often means that we're probably going to have ionic bonds. And of course, if you think about that, metals, by definition, like to lose electrons. They have one or two or three electrons in the outer shell, valence electrons, and they like to lose those electrons to become positive ions. Metals like to become positive ions. Nonmetals like to become negative ions by gaining electrons. So we have already alluded to the fact that there are basically two types of electrons then in our atoms. The valence electrons are the, are the ones in the outermost main energy level that can be shared or exchanged. The core electrons are the ones that make up the inner shells, and those inner shells are generally complete. So the core electrons are not involved in chemical reactions because they're not involved in bonding. It's the valence electrons that are always responsible for the bonding. Now, in the main group elements, and the main group elements include the first two columns on the periodic table, and then you have your transition metals here, and then you have your P block over here, and in your P block, so this is your S block and this is your P block, those are the main group elements, and that's a vocabulary term you should know. The transition metals are in the D block. So when we talk about the main group elements, we're talking your, your valence electrons are in the S and P outer shell. There may not be any P electrons in the outer shell if you're one of the elements in that end um, in the um, S1, S2, S3, S4, and so forth. Uh, other elements that have the P's, electrons in the P, um, those are the outermost shell electrons. Um, so the main group elements are the number of valence electrons that's equal to the group number. Now, there are different ways to number the groups, but we're numbering the groups as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Of course, we're not talking about 8, because uh, th there we're talking about inert gases, and they don't like to gain or lose because they have a stable outer shell, what we often call an octet. Now, your transition elements have the d orbitals in them, okay? 
And sometimes those D electrons can uh, be valence electrons as well. Now, let's say a few words about Gilbert Newton Lewis, who came up with all of these ideas about a century ago. Um, very, very helpful ways to um, represent atoms and to understand chemical bonding. And when you recognize the fact that uh, Dr. Lewis was a very influential teacher, he was an influential teacher because he could come up with models like this that would help people to understand. That is often the job of a teacher, is a teacher has got to come up with illustrations and models and explanations that help students to understand things. And you could also flip that whole sentence. Because he was good at finding simple ways to representing complex things, that's, he became a very, very influential teacher. The other thing, and maybe you think I follow in his footsteps, is he sees the use of problem sets in teaching. And so when you get your weekly homework assignment with problems to solve, um, I hope you see that as more than just a chore, but as a way to practice your problem-solving skills using models and symbols and numbers and equations. And I go through the hundred or so questions at the end of every chapter and try to pick out 12 or 13 for each assignment that kind of represent what's going on throughout the entire chapter. Now, Gilbert Lewis was uh, pretty much quiet about what he believed or didn't believe. He was so involved in his uh, mission, if you will, of teaching and doing chemistry and acid base, thermodynamics, light, electrons, bonding. He probably it looks like he did not pay very much attention at all to spiritual things. Uh, whether or not he thought about him, he never wrote anything down. Um, perhaps he was kind of agnostic or maybe kind of deistic in the sense of, yeah, there's maybe a God out there, but he's not a personal God. And you find people like that all the time in chemistry, or I should say in science in general. The, the majesty and the beauty and the intricacy and the complexity of the science uh, pushes them to think that there is something more than just the material world. Um, but how far they pursue that, and you can look at Romans chapter 1 uh, as, as scientists being included in that group that no one has an excuse for not knowing that there is a God and therefore trying to pursue a relationship with that God because everybody has seen uh, what can only be explained as being the handiwork of God. That's Romans chapter 1. All right, let's um, mention it here the noble gases. Uh, if you think of nobility, the kings and the queens, um, these, these kind of people, or maybe the Hollywood elite, uh, they kind of don't ever interact with um, ordinary people. That's, the, that's characteristic often of the nobility in societies that have very regimented classes. India comes to mind as that example, as well as some of the uh, royalty figures in European Europe in centuries past. But here, by a noble gas, we mean they don't interact um, with other atoms because uh, they basically have a stable configuration. That stable configuration turns out to be an octet, four pairs. So we have four orbitals. Remember, each orbital can only hold two electrons if they have the opposite spin. And so that happens to be a very stable configuration. So if X represents the symbol of my element, and we have an orbital, an orbital, an orbital, an orbital there, I'm using circles or spheres, if you will, like S orbitals would be. And I'm still inadequate with this diagram because it's only in two dimensions. If we could put this in three dimensions with my X in the middle, and then it would look like a pyramid with three balloons on the base and one balloon resting in the, uh, on top of those three balloons, you have a better idea of this octet arrangement in noble gases, very, very stable. And so 
Because noble gases have an octet, we think of an octet as being a stable arrangement. Um, because noble gases have an octet, it gives us reason to think that our model of an octet and four orbitals, one in the S and three in the P, um, seems to model physical truth pretty well. And that's a test of a model. Does it fit reality or not? When models do not fit reality, the models need to be changed or jettisoned and gotten rid of. If you are ever asked by Al-Qaeda, name two elements that do not chemically react with anything else. It's helium and neon. The other inert gases, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon, actually turn out to um, make a few compounds. And we'll learn more about that when we talk about expanded valence. Um, in a later um, screencast. So here's my Lewis dot structure, and you can see we have one dot right here. And then when we come to beryllium, you might say, well, shouldn't we put our two dots for the S subshell um, in the S orbital and leave the other orbitals here and here and here blank? And what actually happens, if you think in terms of stability, stability seems to be a universal law. Things move in the direction of stability, whether it's um, temperature-wise or um, particle distribution-wise. These, uh, these are aspects of the laws of thermodynamics. Um, this electron right here will find another orbital as far away as possible, which in three-dimensional space could be any one of the other three orbitals. If you think of three balloons with a fourth balloon on top, um, forming a tetrahedron kind of, of shape, a pyramidal kind of shape, perhaps. Um, and this way, instead of having two electrons with opposite spin in the same orbital and the other orbitals empty, one of these electrons just comes over to the other orbital and that's a much more stable configuration, which is why magnesium, for example, forms plus two bonds and aluminum forms plus three. Um, uh, alum uh, magnesium forms plus two ions and aluminum forms plus three ions. And again, you can see the hybridizing where instead of talking about boron as looking like this, one of these electrons moves to the other place and technically, we should draw a boron like this. But of course, the printer that printed out this page wasn't able to draw it off at an angle like that. And then, most important of all, we have carbon. And this forms the basis of organic chemistry because carbon can form four bonds because of its hybridizing of those electrons. Silicon forms the basis of all of geology, um, this, the rock structures that make up the crust of our Earth. Now, nitrogen, we begin to double up. And then now we can um, double up again, double up for a third time, and now we have our stable configuration. And you'll notice that all the elements in 1A have one dot in the outer, um, on the right side, we should say they have one electron in their outer shell. So they all like to form plus one ions. That's the beauty of the periodic table. They're all similar elements. And these all form plus two ions and plus three ions. And then in right here, are they going to gain four or lose four? Well, that's a lot to gain or lose. So they have a tendency to just share. And so we get a lot of covalent bonding there. Now, nitrogen would like to gain three which gives it a negative three, oxygen gain two, the 7A column gain one, those are the halogens. And then our inert or noble gases don't need to gain or lose. The beauty of the periodic table is the way in which all the elements that are going to have similar properties turn out to be in the same vertical column. I've already talked about the octet rule. And let's uh, talk a little bit about the difference between rules and laws. Um, sometimes we use these words interchangeably. We could talk about the 
laws of the highway, stop at the stop sign, for example, yield the right of way, don't go over the speed limit. These are rules, these are laws, um, but they can easily be broken. And these rules and laws are imposed by mankind. They are human-made rules and laws that hopefully promote organization and order and safety um, within a community. But there are also the kinds of rules and laws that are moral rules and laws. And these are the rules and laws about what is right and wrong. And when you believe in a God um, who is all good and human beings who are fallen and have evil at our very core, the moral laws reveal to us our our brokenness, our fallenness, um, the fact that we cannot keep God's moral laws. We need somebody to keep those moral laws for us. Those are the ones that come from God himself. Now, we also make human laws that are hopefully based upon God's moral laws. The United States Constitution is supposed to be um, based upon moral laws, and then, of course, they become more and more detailed after that as you flesh them out to apply to all kinds of circumstances and situations. Um, and, and, but these moral laws are supposed to be summarized by um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights um, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is supposed to be based upon the moral law. We also see in the Old Testament ceremonial laws that governed um, the, the temple worship and, and so forth in the Old Testament. So there, uh, uh, And a lot of those laws were fulfilled by Jesus Christ himself. Now, the, the other reason I'm talking about rules and laws is within um, creation, we have the laws that um, we cannot violate or we violate at our own risk within the creation. And we would call these universal laws like the law of gravity or the laws of thermodynamics. And then we also have human laws that we make up, like the octet rule. And the octet rule may be reflecting a universal law. Um, it may not. Now we're going to learn that there are lots of exceptions to the uh, octet rule which shows us the limitations of this man-made observation or rule. It's not like nature is obligated to follow our rules. Nature is obligated to follow God's rules or laws that um, describe the operation of the universe. Um, so, the representation of a molecule that we're, sh we're showing here, back to this octet rule, um, it's called a Lewis electron dot structure, or just a Lewis structure. Sometimes we just call it a dot structure. And you can see here for the Brinkelhoff um, gas diatomic fluorine that each fluorine atom has a single electron um, unpaired in its outer shell. And so they can pair up. Notice that we're now using vocabulary words of lone pairs a pair of electrons that are alone, and here are lone pairs around fluorine. And then you can have bonding pairs. This would be a bonding pair right there, and we often represent bonding pairs with a dash. Um, so we have lone pairs and bonding pairs, or we could say we have non-bonding electrons and bonding electrons. And a bonding electron is an electron invo involved in a bond. You can also have more than one pair of electrons being shared, like you see in carbon dioxide or like in oxygen um, diatomic gas or like we see here in nitrogen, another diatomic gas and member of the Brinkelhoff family. 
So you can have double bonds and triple bonds. And the goal ultimately in sharing of electrons is to achieve what we call a noble gas configuration, eight pairs of electrons located in four orbitals distributed around in three-dimensional space around the core um, electrons. And inside of that, of course, is the core of the atom itself, the nucleus. So this is a tendency. There are exceptions to the octet rule, but it is a sign of stability. And so we, at least for the elements in, say, the first three rows on the periodic table, um, the octet rule is a pretty good predictor. We have a lot more else going on as the atoms get bigger and bigger with more and more energy levels and shells, and therefore the outer electrons are less held, are held in place with less of a pull from the nucleus than the smaller atoms would have. So this is a guideline more than a rule. Just like with a stop sign, there might be a time you go through the stop sign, um, and I hope you don't do this except in an emergency, if you're rushing somebody to the hospital, and like an ambulance might be doing, and you and you pull up uh, to the um, intersection, and there's no cars around, and you go on through. Um, I've never had to do that. Um, it's very, very unlikely, but um, it's, this is a guideline that ought to be followed 99.9999% of the time. And of course, this day and age, you see people floating through stop signs all the time. And that means if you have made a mistake, you have very little time to recover from making that um, decision and it could be fatal to you or the other person. All right. Um, we do mention there are a few exceptions, which we'll get to later. Um, so if, we, if something doesn't follow the octet rule, we might suspect that we might have the wrong formula when we wrote down the formula of the molecule that we are trying to construct the electron dot configuration for, maybe we wrote down the wrong formula. Or maybe we wrote it down when we drew out the structure and chose a central atom, for example, and arranged the atoms around it. Maybe we did that incorrectly as well. So Here's how you approach drawing Lewis dot structure. And, and you might already remember this from first year chemistry. It is systematic. The best way to avoid making mistakes is to do things systematically. Sometimes you get so used to the system that you begin to get sloppy and you depend upon the system um, rather than using the system to help, to help you from making mistakes. So the first thing you wanted to do is to figure out what is the central atom? What is the atom that has the lowest electron affinity for electrons? Which is the atom that um, wants electrons the least? So as you go towards the right side of the periodic table, towards the inert gases, the electron affinity gets greater and greater. So you're looking for atoms like carbon um, that is not as far to the right as you can go. That's often your central atom. Also, you know certain atoms are going to be terminal atoms. You know, for example, that hydrogen is only going to make one bond. Or if chlorine, um, and this is not always true for chlorine, but if chlorine um, has uh, seven electrons, it's only going to make one bond. It would be a terminal atom and therefore would be around the outside or the periphery of a molecule. Um, I actually do this as step number two and I usually do this as step number one. I just count up all the valence electrons in the molecule or in the polyatomic ion. And when I count up all the valence electrons, um, that helps me when I go to um, begin to draw my structure and figure out what the central atom is going to be. Um, if you're doing a polyatomic ion, remember that a cation is a positively charged um, ion, an anion is a negatively charged ion. So if you have a negative one polyatomic ion, you have to add an electron. If it's a negative two, you have to add two electrons. If it's a positive one, you subtract an electron from your total. 
If it's a positive two, you subtract two electrons from the total because that's how it got to be a plus two cation in the first place was by losing two electrons. And then uh, the next thing that I do is I pair up all of those electrons as I draw my model. So we come down here and we begin to distribute our pairs of electrons. Um, when I distribute my pairs of electrons, I be begin by connecting atoms together. And I use the dash as a pair of electrons. And then when I have electrons over, I might start then, since I don't need any more bonds, uh, bonding pairs, then I start doing my um, lone pairs, the pairs of electrons that are not connected. And then I um, use up all my lone pairs of electrons. And sometimes when you use up your, um, when you get to the end of your, your drawing, you might not have enough electrons to have the octet rule, in which case you're going to have to adjust, or you may have electrons left over. When you um, run out of electrons, you invoke double and triple bonding. If you have electrons left over and everything's connected, then you move to something called expanded valence, which is in a sense an exception to the octet rule. And we'll talk about that later. So we use any remaining pairs as lone pairs until we get our octet. Um, now in this particular case, um, when in the atom that you, the molecule that you see here, We've now used up all of our electrons. So carbon had four, and, um, and then we had our two hydrogens, uh, each with one, and then we had our six electrons for oxygen. So we had a total of 12 electrons. So we have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 electrons. And we might say, okay, I'm done. I've used up all my electrons. I'm out of here. Well, not so fast, Kimu Um, We want to remember that we have to obey the octet rule. And you notice carbon only has three pairs of electrons. One, two, three. So carbon needs another pair of electrons. Where can I get another pair of electrons? Well, we come down here and we shift one of those pairs of electrons from here and make a double bond. And so now carbon has four pairs of electrons. You can see the four dashes coming from carbon. Oxygen has four pairs of electrons or an octet. And notice how with my pen, I'm able to draw a sort of a triangle here around the carbon, as well as a triangle here around the oxygen for the, uh, the atoms and the electron pairs that carbon and oxygen are connected to. We'll learn later that this is a trigonal planar around the carbon and trigonal planar around the oxygen. Now, when you do get double and triple bonds, it's almost always when you have carbon, nitrogen, or oxygen. Very few things are going to form a um, a double or triple bond except for those three. Now, this particular activity is an opportunity for you to practice. I'm not going to go into much detail. I will show you, though, that we use brackets around the entire structure with a negative sign when we have a polyatomic ion. And, of course, if I was going to be drawing this molecule, I would probably want to do it in this fashion right here. And then put my dots around it. Your printer for that, public, that uh, printed this book was not able to do that. So useful ideas. The octet rule. We notice the uh, necessity for organic chemistry. Carbon is going to form four bonds. You can also have double and triple bonds and we'll reinforce this when we get to organic chemistry. There is no such thing as a quadruple bond. No such thing. And in a couple pages, we're going to talk about isoelectronic. 
Iso, of course, means same. In organic chemistry, we're going to talk about isomers. Earlier in the semester, we talked about isotopes, um, atoms with the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. And you should now be able to predict the structure of hydrogen compounds thanks to the octet rule and what you have learned. Um, keep in mind that the drawings here are in two dimensions, not in three dimensions. You're going to be doing a lab in organic chemistry where you'll be using styrofoam balls and toothpicks to construct molecules in three dimensions so that you can see that um, an awful lot of these molecules are not flat at all. Most importantly, I would like you to always draw the oxygen molecule as a bent structure. I would encourage you never to draw the water molecule as a linear structure. And you would find that even hydrogen peroxide is going to be bent around both oxygen atoms as well. And of course, this is going to be tetrahedral. And this is not going to be um, looking like that, but it's going to be um, trigonal planar around each nitrogen. These are going to be tetrahedral around each carbon, trigonal planar around each carbon. We'll be talking more about that later. This one will be the way that it looks because this, um, if you think about a hydrogen that's sharing an electron, that leaves a positive charge on the other side. And so the two nuclei, the two protons that make up the two hydrogen atoms are going to repel each other and get as far away from each other as possible, putting them on opposite sides of the two carbons. And here's another molecule or a pair of molecules and I'm going to let you go through for practice if you feel like you need the practice. Here are some um, Structures of oxy acids, and I think I skipped that part. Yeah, there we go. Oxy acids and their anions. Remember, an acid wants to donate a proton if you're using the Bronsted Lowry um, approach. And so the nitrate ion, which is NO3 with a minus one charge, um, can donate a proton, which would be a hydrogen. It, it can uh, or well, doesn't have a hydrogen to donate, but it can receive a hydrogen from something, and then you can get your nitric acid. And, um, and vice versa is also true. You can lo lose that hydrogen, and, um, and that's what acids do. Acids like to lose hydrogens, and what's left behind, your conjugate base of the nitric acid, is the nitrate ion. Now, I should point out that why is that a double bond there, but that's single and that's single. In fact, we might want to say it should look more like this, and where should that double bond go? And there is no thermodynamic reason to favor one oxygen over the other. We're going to learn later when we talk more about resonance that those two other electrons and of course you've got all these around the three oxygens, those two electrons are going to be kind of evenly distributed throughout the nitrogen uh, complex, throughout the entire polyatomic ion. But for the sake of our diagram, we, we, lay, we let one of those nitrogen-oxygen bonds be a double bond. Now, isoelectronic, of course, means we have two structures with the same number of electrons. The word electronic always refers to electrons. So here are some isoelectronic species. The word species here has nothing to do with biology. Um, the word species here is, uh, could be um, forms or types or examples. Um, but uh, we often use the word species here as sort of a generic reference to multiple structures that are different from each other, but related somehow. 
So you should know what the word isoelectronic is. They have, and if they're isoelectronic, they're going to have similar electronic structures because they have similar numbers of electrons. And um, isoelectronic means they could be isostructural. You don't see the word isostructural as much. And here are some examples of isoelectronic species that have the same number of electrons, and therefore they have similar type structures. So ammonium is right here. So we would expect these to look very much like that in terms of structure. Even if they're not overall charged like methane, it should have a similar structure. Um, here we have two species that are isoelectronic, same number of electrons, and it's going to look like this. Hydrogen, 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 and lone pair. And we, and we can do that for all of these as well. Common isoelectronic molecules. Now, just as a preview, uh, multiple choice questions in this section can be very challenging. For example, one multiple choice question might give you four, might give you five structures, one, two, three, four, five, and might say, which one of the five structures is not isoelectronic? And it takes a while to do that problem because you've got to figure out which four are isoelectronic in order to identify the one that is not the same. And again, you should do the review to check yourself.